Hey, listeners, thank you so much for tuning in today. I am really excited to bring you this episode. It's all about the beauty of being a misfit. And this time of year when we're like giving two middle fingers to diet culture and saying, no, absolutely not, I'm done. This is the perfect episode to start off the guest conversations for 2018. But before we dig into the conversation, I want to make sure you know all about the chance to work with me for a full year in the first ever Body Kindness Spiral Up Club. So this is a membership club and it has two main parts. There is a password protected private space on my website. When you become a member, you'll log in and you'll get an email prompt for me for a spiral up activity. You'll get a little story or lesson and then um, some time and suggestions for work that you could do to learn and grow in that area. So you'll get anywhere between two and four of those a month and I will provide additional resources there um, that will help support that. I'm also including a book club. So if you want to read or reread the book, um, I will be queuing uh, chapters to read and also throughout the content I'll be cross-referencing if you have the book and want to um, reference what else is in this topic area turn to these pages. Um, there's a lot more on the website where you can learn about it at bodykindnessbook.com slash spiral up. Part two of the program is an optional online community. It's private and it's on Facebook. And this is a place where you can come to dive deeper in conversation about the work you're doing individually, but also share what's going on in your day-to-day to to get listening and support and encouragement from other like-minded, anti-diet, body-positive, self-care-focused individuals. And I'll be there too, uh, listening, offering encouragement and advice. And it's already open and people are joining. And I got to tell you, it's really magical and helpful. I can already see it. Um, It's a place of non-judgment. And, you know, I really want you to know that you can feel This is a place where you can be brave and share what's going on, ask for support and encouragement, and you'll see how when you use these two together that they really help you spiral up. In addition, I am offering five bonuses, which you can learn about when you go to the website. It's bodykindnessbook.com slash spiral up. And there's two payment options. You can pay in full and get a a little bit of a discount, um, or you can make four $90 $90 payments. Uh, so it works out to less than a dollar a day. And um, I would love to have you there. As a member, you also get additional perks throughout the year, all kinds of things that I'm planning. Um, but the big one that I want to share is that if you decide that you need some one-on-one time with me, or if you want to do any of the e-courses that I end up um, producing in the next year, you will get the best price available better than anywhere else just for being um, a Body Kind of Spiral Up Club member. Uh, Registration is open now, but it is limited. It's not going to be open forever because we need to get started on our journeys this year. So if you think you might be interested, visit Body Kindness book.com slash spiral up. Check it out. If you have questions, please email me. It's Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. And I also want to say if you have a financial hardship and you can't swing the payment options, please let me know. Shoot me a note. I am open and interested to hear your story. I do want to make this accessible. There is an inclusivity statement on the page that talks about this is a place for all people, all bodies, genders, race, and needs. And I understand that not everyone um, has the disposable income to be part of this, but you at least have internet access to take part. So um, I really want to remove as many barriers as I can, and I hope to see you there. Now, on to the show. You will not believe my guest. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. So today... Um, I am speaking with Lydia Yuknovich. Lydia is a national best-selling author of the novels The Book of Joan, The Small Backs of Children, Dora, A Head Case, and the memoir The Chronology of Water. Her new book is The Misfits Manifesto, and it was released in October 2007. Her acclaimed TED Talk, The Beauty of Being a Misfit, has over two 
million views. She is the recipient of two Oregon Book Awards and was a finalist for the 2017 Brooklyn Public Library Literary Prize and the 2012 Penn Center Creative Nonfiction Awards. She writes, teaches, and lives in Portland, Oregon. And I got to tell you, this conversation was really powerful for me. Um, It really helped me give a space to the fact that Um, We have a lot of differences in life, but there are similarities that unite the misfits, and um, you can find a community of people who um, have also experienced pain and suffering who can turn their life around, and no matter what they faced, are worthy and important human beings, and they have beauty and power and purpose in life. So um, if you've been struggling yourself with big, big things this past year or several years or your whole life, and you happen to be listening, or maybe this is someone you love, I hope that you'll find a benefit to this conversation and know that no matter what, you are worthy and important and you have valuable things that only you can contribute to this world. Here's the show. Hey, Lydia, welcome to Body Kindness. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure, Rebecca. I'm really excited to be here. I cannot wait to have this conversation with you uh, as the my my misfit shero, if you will, <laughs> because I definitely feel after watching your TED Talk and reading your wonderful book, Misfits Manifesto, that uh, we all should embrace the elements of us that make us feel like a misfit. And I feel more valued as a person after reading it. Um, and oh, I, that's nice. Oh, yes, absolutely. It, it, it really... It really helped me to have more compassion for myself um, in ways where, you know, I can be high on empathy for others so much that I needed this reminder of, um, you know, just ways that I can feel like I don't quite measure up or match or fit in and that that actually could be an asset. (laughs) Right. Right. That's Um, the whole idea. Yeah. So I would love just for purpose of background for, for, for listeners. Um, I'll include the notes, um, in the notes, your Ted talk link in in case they miss that, but that's been viewed by like 2 million people or more (laughs) maybe by now, but that's popular. Um, and of course the link to your book and work, I'll include all that at, at the end, but for purpose of background, um, I would love if you could just share a little bit about yourself and, and the work that you're currently doing. Sure. Well, I talk a little bit about my background in the TED Talk, but Mm -hmm. like so many people, I run from rough beginnings. Mm -hmm. I started out in a kind of abusive household, and so there was kind of a bumpy road from the Mm get-go. And one of the things that sort of saved me from drowning was that I was on a swim team. I was a competitive swimmer for around 18, 20 years. Um, and it gave me a way to be out of the house and kind of hold on to a some kind of identity while I was, you know, coming of age and growing up. And when I finally got away from the sort of yuck household, um, I went to college. But it was really the first time I'd ever tried to forge an identity away from, you know, just trying to survive. And so, again, like so many of us, I kind of bumbled that as well and uh, didn't do so well in college, flunked out a couple of times, uh, discovered drinking and sex and, you know, ways to both numb oneself, but also just explore like, what is life if you're not incarcerated by family anymore? Mm -hmm. Um, So, so, you know, kind of rough beginnings, but not unique. The more people I meet, the more I understand that's just so many of us. And so eventually what sort of brought me back to life turned out to be writing, and I would be say it broader than that, I think, artistic practice. You know, when I discovered that in life, uh, it sort of gave me the understanding that self-expression 
was a choice available to me instead of self-destruction. So the day I sort of stood up inside the idea that I could make art, any kind of art, um, was probably the day I, I got born for real. Um, and so, so I try to, in my own writing, as I've evolved as a writer, I've tried to explore more and more and evolve the idea that we have to forge our own storylines or somebody's going to take them away from us. And we're in a zeitgeist right now where that's particularly, <laughs> you know, um, there's a light on that idea right now. So what I'm doing out in the world now is trying to make story bridges to other people so that as our stories cross each other, we can remind each other what matters in life. Yes, like humanity. Yeah, remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Just the basics that we are all human beings and no matter yes. what, what, what no matter what we have or don't have we're all worthy of kindness and respect and love right and passion right and we're all walking around holding so tightly inside these stories in ourselves about shame or messing up or not fitting into what society thinks we should look like or be like or how we can succeed. And what I'm finding is if we loosen our grip on those stories we're holding onto so tightly and share them with each other, we can remind ourselves that we're always making up our own stories of how to be in life. And it's okay to do it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also be open to your story evolving. Like exactly. my story now is is not my story what it was when I was in college and I'm grateful for that, but I think a lot of people can get scared when they see their story starting to change. Right. Right, I find that too. I so agree with you. I mean, it doesn't even make sense that you would be the same story your entire life. I mean, right? No. Change is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every, every, I don't know, for me, it turns out about every six or seven years, some radical, radical, either body change or life change or love change or, you know, um, something large <laughs> shakes everything up. And if, if you can't let go of the stories you started with, you can't figure out how to move forward. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely essential. It's it's not necessarily that it's going to be easy, but being having your eyes open enough to to take a risk and be curious about, well, what is this and, you know, how what does it mean for me and can and can I evolve with this and right. you know, just sit sit with that fear but be willing to the fact that everything everything impacts your your view and your experiences are going to impact and um and it's and it's usually when we are changing, I I think that we're trying to change for the better. So keeping that in mind too, that it's about growing and right, you know. Um, well, let's let's. I have all these questions I want to ask, but I feel mm. like first I need your definition of what is a misfit. Well, I mean, in some ways, I think every human mammal walking around on the planet has a piece of misfittery inside them. I mean, we can all identify with pieces of misfit mm -hmm. in all of us. But what I got particularly interested in is those of us who have either had experience in life or who, for whatever reasons from the inside out, just never quite feel like we're able to stand inside the same storylines as all the people around us. And so we end up feeling like we live at the edges or, you know, in the blind spots of culture. And what I noticed is that we all have stories too, and our stories are as useful to hear about as, you know, the celebrity stories or the so-called completely successful people stories. But our culture is saturated with the, you know, shiny, fancy people <laughs> stories. And what I'm interested in is, kind of the rest of us and <laughs> and what we have to lend to each other and and to the culture that could help us all feel a little more human mm -hmm. well um there are so many good elements of your book that i wrote down when i was reading and um 
I'm not even sure which one to start with, but I, based on what you just said, I'm pulling out um, where you you talk about basically misfits are needed, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and that our stories are a form of of knowledge, right? That that is helping others understand because they might not be a misfit in that area. That's kind of what I was picking up right, from it. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, I came up with this idea that, okay, so let's say there's a whole bunch of us who don't feel like we live in the center of things mm-hmm. and we feel like we live more and, and understand life more at the edges. And so I was thinking about that as an image mm-hmm. and I drew it on a piece of paper and I, and I recognized that the edges of any shape are what makes something have a shape. <laughs> <laughs> True. And, and so then I, I started thinking about that. Well, if, if we're the edges, if we're the perimeter, if we're on the mm-hmm. outside, quote unquote, what is that generative of? I mean, we all know what, when we say an outsider, we all have a narrative in our heads of a person who doesn't fit, right? Mm -hmm. They're on the outside. But a different question is, what's out there? (laughs) What can you report from the perimeter? And what do you have to give from out there? And so when I start talking to the other people in the book, I listen so hard for what they feel like is generated from their position. And so I heard things like, you know, well, we're really good at kind of guarding the perimeter or we're really good at innovating and making up and reinventing things that people in the center haven't thought of. Or we're really good in chaotic or tense situations because it doesn't shock us. It doesn't, you know, our world doesn't feel turned upside down because most of us started out in upside down world. So <laughs> it's familiar, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's like we can stay calm and help out. And so as the stories in the book show, I started kind of compiling this list of useful things you can learn from misfit people. And turns out it's a beautiful list. It's a beautiful list of how we can help all kinds of people, not just each other. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, I'm, br- I'm pulling this kind of back into the context of where I'm working at right now, which is like, mm-hmm. for most of my life, I would say was like in the center, right? Like a big part of diet culture, like eat this yeah. to be healthy, do this right. workout to be healthy. And, right. you know, it was all tied up into, lose weight, prevent weight gain. And I mean, that's still, that's still the major source of power, you know, $60 billion a year. I mean, there is still a very strong center, um, you know, that, you know, and then underneath that, right, the layers of, you know, um, our worthiness is our appearance. The worst thing a possible, a person could be is in a larger body and all these, you know, belief systems that all those things are broken and that, you know, but what what shifted everything from me was actually hearing the stories of the people on the edges. So right. people in a larger body or people right. in a larger body who are also black, right? right? And instead of just doing the same thing I was always doing, just honestly taking a seat <laughs> Right. And listening to their right. experiences. And it was mind blowing and life changing for right. me. It helped it their work helped me heal personally, right? Right. And then, you know, I mean, I'm I'm still from a place of privilege, but because their work impacted me and kind of I'm I'm closer to the edge kind of making these waves I can use what power I do have to continue to uplift you know their experiences and showcase their work and and continue to center their stories so featuring the misfits right. is what 
you know, I guess I have to say I hope because I don't have evidence of this, but what I hope and believe will actually help to eradicate the idea of our appearances, our worth, and, yes. you know, the diet culture stuff that we have. So is is that is that specific example following with um, your mindset? So much, yes, okay. which is partly why I think you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> Yes, but the voices and the bodies in the Misfit book are exactly mirroring what you just said. So when readers read those stories, it's a form of listening, right, to Mm -hmm. somebody who's not you. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear Native American voices and trans voices and ample-bodied voices and disability voices and African-American voices and the voice of a veteran with a purple heart. And, and so exactly like what you just described, my effort was to amplify a whole variety of voices, but also importantly, and crossing with your work, bodies, different mm-hmm. kinds of bodies, because American culture above any other culture is so image mm-hmm. and felt obsessed, <laughs> you know, as you say, there's a whole, you know, longstanding industry Um, attempting to homogenize our bodies, and I would say also our body stories. Mm -hmm. And so I am so much with you on this idea that amplifying other people's stories from those edges, you know, away from the industry mono story, is how we learn to listen to each other, like you said, and just start seeing each other again, Mm -hmm. not in the image of you know, a society success story, but in the image of our individuality and differences. Yeah, uh, it's and and being able to respect that with differences comes um, an expanded awareness and knowledge and information that helps everybody grow. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I got to think, you know, empowers more people, reduces conflict, uh, hopefully even reaches less war and, you know, crime, it it kind of even goes out to that level, you know, that there's, you know, that, that, that the human element of what it means to support an other, somebody who could be so different from you in any number of ways is actually helpful to all. And and I bet that when you actually do take time one-on-one, that there are connections that you can find that that help you on a personal level, even though that That's wasn't right. even necessarily the goal in the beginning, you know? I do. I do. I was just talking to my agent last night Mm -hmm. and we were both, we both had a couple glasses of wine. (laughs) (laughs) Always wisdom (laughs) in vino veritas. (laughs) But uh, for 20 years, I have taught at a community college in East Portland, Oregon. And so the population is a generalized community college, which everyone can imagine, but also it's sort of, um, much more conservative population than downtown Portland. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I was describing to my friend uh, how every classroom I taught in out there, the majority of the people in it came from conservative backgrounds, farming backgrounds, religious backgrounds, white backgrounds. But they're having to sit in a room of otherness with people they didn't necessarily have a lot of contact with. Because, you know, in a classroom, you don't have a lot of choice about who's in the room with you. And so I've witnessed firsthand how those things that are dividing us in our country right now in such angry and, you know, seemingly insurmountable ways, um, I've seen it shift. I've seen I've seen the moment where a whole room of people who aren't anything like each other start sharing their stories, Mm -hmm. and it's not possible to look at them with bigotry anymore. It's not possible to pretend they don't exist or pretend you know who they are and what they're about. The the sharing of stories and this thing you said earlier, like relearning how to listen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) We're so bad at that in this country. Yes. Uh, 
Um, but relearning how to listen and see, really yeah. see each other. I don't know. I think it's such a big deal. Yeah. And, you know, you know, just for, I mean, yes, a hundred percent, it is a big deal. And I think, you know, a couple things just that, that relate to, um, you know, sort of that more literal concerns that, that a listener may have, like with it being the new year and what's the next diet thing. And, oh, I love body right. kindness, but uh, are you sure, you know, there's all those doubts. It's like, well, in the, in the one sense, there's the listening to your inner voice and mm -hmm. hopefully it is a caregiver voice. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> that is right? concerned about your well-being, right? And Rather, right. Yes. Yeah, cuz you might hear this the critical, you know, you know, you're a misfit, you're in a larger body or you ate whatever over the holidays and just, you know, that sort of like the judgments and here's all the ways that you don't fit in, right? Because right. a lot of times that's what that's what boosts this need is that you hear it from inside and of course all the cultural messages that you get, every right. commercial that you see, everyone who said something over the holidays about, oh, another cookie, you know, I'll burn this off in a few weeks or whatever, right. you know, it's like you're, it's, you're constantly being bombarded with it, but you know, to, to stop and listen to, to a true caregiver voice inside your own head right. about what is really going to be good for you. Are you going to be a better person if you clamp down and deprive yourself of food or push yourself too hard in the gym or whatever it would require? Is that really going to make you a better person? And, right. you know, I, I definitely find that people have this, if they s slow down and listen to their intuition, that they've got enough past experiences to know that all of that stuff is unhelpful. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so much. I'm. The, I had a mantra that I switched over to pretty recently mm -hmm. in terms of my own inner voices, mm. and I, um, I switched this inner narrative I had walking around to something like, "I'm exactly the size and shape I need to be in order to write the books I want to write and love my family." Mm. And, this, and I, so I literally like walking around or doing work or driving around in the world, I'd repeat it in my head. Mm -hmm. And pretty quickly, I felt differently. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't worried about how my pants were fitting. Mm -hmm. or, you know, you like, could actually worry about doing real work. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's been so illuminating to me because there's so much work to do in the world that's so much more important mm -hmm. than than your spelt factor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, you know, everybody's weight or size or shape should be determined by their lives and their own uh, understanding of health and taking care of oneself, mm -hmm. and the conditions of your life and world. Um, and so I think, you know, I so much agree with you. We need to look at those inner stories, those mm -hmm. self stories. And because I'm a writer, I know this is true. You can revise them. You can change <laughs> them. You can delete them and replace them with something else. Right. You know, and it, or at least choose the direction you want to go. Yes. Yes. You know, yes. so like, do, you know, yes, hope and confidence may be low, but choose the direction you want to go and keep and yeah, scribble down your notes and rewrite and revise, but just, just get it going um, because that's, that is how you will um, cultivate an even more kind or compassionate voice. And, and, yes. and, and sooner or later you do, it, it gets easier to make the choices. It gets easier to see what you want and don't want. And it gets easier Absolutely. to stay in that, to stay in that direction. Um, so yeah, you know, and I think it does, I think it does connect to this bigger picture of humanity like we started off with. Uh, yes. You know, I'm just thinking of a, of a recent example with, with a client who is new to me, you know, and it's so interesting how, how people come to you, but this particular person ended up coming to me most directly through um, this 
and it's going to connect you through swimming. How fun is this? So there is a triathlon coach in the DC area who literally basically taught me how to swim. I did like one triathlon and I was like, I was not a good swimmer and he helped <laughs> me. I, I happen to follow him, you know, on Instagram and stuff. So we reconnected and, um, and he had sent clients to me before who who were asking for sports nutrition help, but he knew that I had he knew I had rational advice and I wasn't going to do anything crazy. Um, and so we had reconnected, and he was posting in his group, letting them know about my book and also about, you know, like we might try to do some, you know, like body kindness and you know, movement stuff together. So to kind of take away that sort of, you know, rugged exterior of what it means to be an athlete and intensity mm-hmm. of what it means to do a triathlon and just right. like, can we bring some fun and joy up in this place? So, um, and, and, and so, so that was how I got the direct referral. But then I also found out in talking with her that she had heard about my book through, through a podcast she was listening to. It was actually run by a former dietetic intern of mine. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and which, you know, at that time I was still doing all the wrong stuff, but we both eventually found our our way to, you know, compassion and well-being instead of weight focus. Um, But anyway, in our first conversation, it became clear that she does such amazing work for humanity. And Mm -hmm. it's very labor intensive, but she does it because she cares deeply about the work that she does and she knows she's good at it. And there are times when she has to be vulnerable in her work and, you know, and struggling with body image and just her recognizing that as another form of labor that she has to do and removing the blame of herself. There's nothing wrong with her body, right? And yes. that, and it's like the problem really is that our culture says there's something wrong with it. Yes. Um, and yeah, it was just very like, you know, she cried. It was very freeing for her to, you know, label that as that is that all these vulnerabilities are wrapped up and a sickness in our culture. Yes. Not me. Oh, and by the way, as hard as it is to be seen more visibly, I know that that's how people get information. And I know that by being seen, I'm making space for other people who are my size to be seen. Right. right. Oh, I love that story so much. I was like fist pumping in it <laughs> while you were talking. <laughs> I love that story. I identify with it too. Because, you do? Yeah, because I mean, on a kind of sideways way, mm-hmm. which is, I'm I'm a pretty hardcore introvert, and mm-hmm. so it still amazes me that I was even able to do that TED talk without literally dying. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but I, I got to hear, I, I want you to finish your story, but then I want to hear how did it even get to that point? Because I know you didn't wake up and say, one day I dream, dear no, diary, I want to give a TED talk. No, I know that was that, not it. It just sounds like death to me. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a person who, who literally has to labor to leave the house each day mm. and act like you're normal, like everybody else, which that terrible word, normal, mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Getting on a TED stage is is about as close to deadly as anything I can think of. Um, but uh, one of the things I've learned is similar to what you're saying. To be seen in that way, even though it felt like I might die while I was up there, um, I have learned open space for other people who feel visible or wrong or freakish to breathe a little bit and and risk being seen too. So, so in the end it was completely worth it, but I, I will say I felt like I was going to die. (laughs) (laughs) So, so, um, and you did it anyway. So that's lesson one, do the shit that scares you. We can swear on this podcast, by the way, it's explicit with everything. So if it comes out, hooray, but do what scares you. And, um, what so so yeah so I'd love to hear a little bit more about about the backstory. You know, actually, I want to ask this first. Did what? So one of the stories I loved um, 
was that you talked about your writing and your art, and it sounded like a pretty miserable failure trip to New York because you're... <laughs> Sorry, but no, like right. that's basically, you know, like you had all these opportunities and it was like nothing. So yep. did did that come I hope you can share some of that story. And did that come before the TED? I'm guessing it came before the TED Talk. Oh, so. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so that, share that story, whatever you're willing, because it's like, I mean, that made me feel good. Like, okay, I, you know, in situations where I have feel like I really screwed up an opportunity, like I'm not the only one. Oh, God, yes. I I wish more of us would share this story because I, now I know it's a lot of us. Um, but mm-hmm. when I was in my 30s, I won a writing prize and the prize was a trip to New York City to meet agents and editors and fancy writer people, mm-hmm. which I talk about in the TED Talk. So, you know, anyone else who has healthy drive and ambition and, you know, is moving forward in their life, the opportunity would have been extraordinary. But for some of us, we don't actually have an organic ability to respond well with, you know, the hand that's held out to you, even when it's right in front of your face, because some of us are walking around with coding that says, you don't deserve this. Or, you know, this must be some kind of fluke or, you know, other self narratives. You tell yourself that even when it's happening right in front of you, you don't know how to stand up inside of it. And so that's what happened to me in New York. I had many nice things come right up to my face and, you know, offers of publication and representation. And, um, and I, I didn't exactly freeze, but I didn't know how to say yes. And I didn't know how to seize on these opportunities or, or even smile and you know, um, <laughs> not wow. act like, like an idiot. And so, yeah. <laughs> so I sort of folded it up in on myself mm-hmm. and it, it took me, I mean, this is going to sound nutty, but it took me years to follow through on the opportunities that were presented to me in that week. Mm -hmm. And when I say years, I mean like a decade. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think it's important to say that out loud is that I'm not the only one. I mean, there are legions of us who don't have that skill set to know how to feel like we deserve it when something amazing happens. And we have to learn how to stand up in it differently than other people. And so it seems important to me to start telling those stories so those of us who have this, you know, experience feel less alone. Because at this point in my life, I'm doing fine, and I was able to stand up inside of it. It just took me a long time, and I I had to invent how to do it, you know? Right, yeah. Well, and... It took you a long time, and now with what you're doing, it will hopefully help others take not as long so. time. Um, um, if I could save somebody else a decade, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. And also, I can save the money on therapy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, and it's it just you know goes goes to show that, um, you know. We all we all make mistakes, and also sometimes people see things in us that we can't see in ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, we're just not ready yet. Always, yeah. You know, I, yep. I I certainly see it a lot just in you know people I consider my professional peers, and one might do more training, and the other, you know, like we kind of all do, you know. And it's just like, oh yeah, I totally see a memoir about this, or you know, oh I could. T- easily see you doing some e-course on that. And, you know, a lot of times the, it, it you get met with like pause and like, are you sure, you know, like yeah. really me? Yeah. And um, I think the only reason why maybe I can verbalize that to other people is one on the one sense, like I see their power the mm-hmm. and potential and need um, and that and that I have been fortunate to experience success and, uh, yeah, in the beginning have fear, 
you know, work my way through it. And it's not that what you make up is some perfect straight line or everything's handed to you. You know, it's, no. it actually sucks. It mostly sucks. Yeah, but yes, <laughs> yes, it mostly sucks. Yes. You know, and, and I'm sure you can relate with this. It doesn't matter what you have accomplished. There's some part of you that is just like, oh, well, compared to that, that ain't shit. And so, you know, right. it's just you, I think other people, you know, like, have a certain respect for you and your accomplishments, but, the, but on the inside, you don't even necessarily see that. Right. No. And so it's, it becomes this mix of, well, of course it's easy for me to see this person succeeding in certain ways in that person. And so I, I share these ideas just because I, I see it and I believe it. Um, but then reflecting back on myself, I think part of what gives me that skill is experience su- success, but it's not without, a tremendous amount of like you suck radio playing nonstop right. in my head. Right. Absolutely. And so, so I'm fascinated by that because, okay, so if we all have different degrees of you suck mm-hmm. in our head, radio in our heads, mm-hmm. which I love that phrase. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's say we all have some version of that in our heads. Yeah. Okay. So I want to bring that question I mentioned earlier, even to that space, like, okay, what is the you suck radio realm generative of? Is there anything useful inside there we could like mm. pick out and hold up and say, well, actually there's a tool in there and it, it helps you do this other thing. <laughs> so I'm just really trying to look at words, you know, words and concepts like failure or mm-hmm. suck dumb or mm-hmm. doing it wrong or feeling and inadequate or fucking up just, you know, those normal negative spaces as possibly having something in there that we can find, pull out and use in our lives instead of just wallowing in suckdom. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which is certainly go, you know, that's kind of wallowing in suckdom is going to guarantee you know, that progress is at least slow, if not stagnant, right? Yep. And we're back to the taking a decade. To <laughs> yep, that's right. Um, a sad tale. <laughs> so I do want to know about how you got into, how you got on the TED stage. I mean, it's just, um, it's amazing. And, and, and a, look, and a lot of people can get great TEDx regionals and get decent yeah. views. Um, but I mean, you got on a stage and you got a lot of views. So, um, yeah, take me, take me through that process. Well, a little bit, um, and it's hard for, uh, depressed, cynical people to believe in magic, but a little (laughs) piece of it is, is from a magic realm because one of the women who runs, helps run those Ted talks had read my memoir the chronology of water and she emailed me privately and asked me if i would ever even entertain the idea and at first i was like don't look at the email don't read it don't answer it run away (laughs) um but i didn't run away Mm -hmm. and a few days after i'd read it i risked answering it and i just said something vague like well what did you have in mind (laughs) And she suggested I try taking one of the chapters from Chronology of Water and seeing if I could distill it into like a 12 to 14 minute storytelling act. She's very sly, this woman. Her name is <laughs> Helen Waters, and she's extraordinary and wonderful. Mm. Uh, but she came at it kind of low key and talked to me about the possibility of making a smaller story. And that didn't seem overwhelming. And so so I tried that, and it was just a writing act. Mm. And I sent it to her, and she said, you know, I think we could, we could make this into a TED Talk. And it still wasn't real to me. I was just like, well, I'm writing a little story, and it's fine. <laughs> and I'm still in my house, in my underwear, and everything's fine. I am safe. I am at home. I have my pen in my hand. <laughs> yes, it's all good. And so then when I was sort of put into the, you're really going to give a TED Talk shoot, what happens is you start Skyping with a small team of TED people 
who coach you and you literally practice on your computer in a room, you know, some room in your house where you're Skyping and pretending to give your talk and then they give you feedback. And that was, that was horrifying. And terrifying. <laughs> I mean, um, <laughs> so that, that was like a four month process and that almost killed me, but then I didn't die. So I kept going <laughs> and then, um, and then we're, we're in Vancouver and we get there a week earlier than my talk, which in retrospect was probably a mistake because that meant I had to fight off throwing up for like six days in a row <laughs> till it was my turn. <laughs> and, and the really big piece of the story that everyone should know if they ever watch that TED talk is that the person I had to go on after was the singer John Legend. Who, oh, geez. Are you serious? <laughs> like Grammy Award winning, you know? Yeah. I yeah, that guy. Stay that guy. With- yeah. yeah, you don't, you do not want to hear me sing. That is not a gift I possess. And that Actually, is not modesty. I liked it. <laughs> you have a low bar. I mean, karaoke, I will. Let's go do karaoke sometime. We'll make it happen. I love it. <laughs> but. Yeah. So you had to go after him basically. Yeah. Like literally like, you know, the next person they call up there is me. And so immediately I can't feel my legs and <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm going to poop my pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cause you know, I just explained to you, I'm mm-hmm. a hardcore introvert. So that's like as nightmarish as it could possibly be. Um, but in the end I didn't die. And even my son who's, 16 when he watched it he said you know i can see the moment your fear crests and your story just sort of carries you to the end and that's it that sentence he said Mm -hmm. that's what happened my fear Mm -hmm. crested and i didn't die and and the story was worth it because now i've met all these other people who feel less small Mm-hmm. Because I didn't die on that. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> well, and then that turned into the book, right? Because this is a book right. that's got the right. TED Talks. Right. You know, so you just don't get those. You get selected. So how did how did the talk evolve into the book? Um, well, one of the editors for TED Books was at my talk. And so she asked if she could come talk to me about a possible book project. And so we did that. And I told her the only way I'd agree to do it is if it wasn't just Lydia blathering on about misfittery for 200 pages, (laughs) but could we include, you know, up to 10 other voices and bodies? And Mm -hmm. if we could, if they would allow that, then I would absolutely be willing to do it because then there'd be a reason besides Mm me. Mm -hmm. And And what, and what another place, you know, I mean, it's, it's a revisit from earlier, but it's worth noting, right. To, to be in this, to have this opportunity to know what is really important, right? Like that's a very giving nature. And, you know, to, you know, if I'm going to be part of something that matters, yeah. My hard line is that I need to raise the voices of people who didn't get the TED Talk. Exactly. Who have every right to share what's happening with them and who actually make make the book better for readers. So if we're talking about helping people, we got to do it my way. That's right. (laughs) And for miraculous reasons, the Ted people and the Simon and Schuster people agreed to that. (laughs) And I'm so happy. I'm so happy because now that it's out in the world, I also, I also ask that they be allowed to audio record their own sections for the audio book. So So none of them had ever been in a recording studio. (laughs) that, That was amazing and wonderful. And they've been going to readings with me too. So I get to sit oh, and listen to them read their own stories. And I've been bawling my way through oh, these readings because they're so beautiful. God. They're so beautiful. Oh, gosh. That yeah. is amazing. I have chills now just thinking of that. I so mean, beautiful. Br- yeah. Come to the reading. Bring some tissues. Leave tissues. with a book. <laughs> 
Wow. And just what, I mean, how often do you think about where you've come from and like, or the, the little girl who got abused, you know, like every day. Yeah. Every day. I mean, because I mean, not everybody makes it out of those situations. Right. I, I dedicate my life work probably mostly to the people who didn't make it because mm-hmm. I understand how close any of us could be to that, mm-hmm. um, given the right circumstances, you know, mm-hmm. and conditions and experiences. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think about it every day. And I think I have this little picture of myself when I was four where I was quote unquote running away from home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I have this little suitcase in my hand and this big ugly doll. Mm-hmm. And I keep that photo close to my heart because she really had the imagination to understand she was going to have to get herself out of there. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, the imagination of children is um, our most powerful resource. Mm-hmm. So I try to I try to remember her that way, that, you know, as bad as things were for some people as kids, it was also the birth of our, you know, the most powerful imaginations in the world are children who survive. Yeah. So that's another thing that's good that can come from the dark. Right. Well, I mean, it, it, an example of, of resilience and that, right. you know, bad things happen to good people and innocent children all the time. And, um, you know, if by magic power, you know, God, whatever, whatever Whatever is communicating (laughs) to you, right. Um, that can, can help, you know, cultivate resilience. You know, it's, it's, it's powerful to me to think about, you know, it is an innocent child who's deprived of necessary connection to feel safe and loved in the world, you know, and, and that is, we're supposed to get that from our parents and that, you know, critical brain connections and, you know, and yeah, we know it wasn't all this bad stuff happened to me and I just came out great. Like you had to go yeah. through your own downward spirals in life. But the fact that now, Somebody who lacked this connection is now being the connector. Right. Is kind of amazing. Right. Yeah. And so, see, we do have a use value, those of us who mm-hmm. can sometimes be treated like we're the broken ones. Mm-hmm. It's it's ironically the opposite. We're mm-hmm. because the, the we've healers, ex- yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Because we've experienced brokenness, we know how to put things back together. <sighs> oh. I love that. It's making me think of the quote about the gold and the broken. I yeah. I don't remember it, but we know. I'll share it. Yeah. In the- <laughs> it's but it but it's, it is. exactly yeah. Um, yes, it's the gold that brings together the broken pieces. And yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's just so good and so powerful. And you know, a lot of times I talk with folks about the power of of acceptance. You know, in the phrase mm-hmm. like it is what it is, and 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 and. and acceptance, whether it's accepting something of yourself or others. Um, how do you see that fitting in to kind of owning your role as a misfit? Like, I guess I'm thinking of like accepting there, there are certain things about culture that's going to make it harder for you. Yeah. How do you like accept, you know, how do you see that fitting in so that it makes you step into your misfit stronger so that you can go out there and be the healers and the putting the put, the pieces back together again. Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, mm-hmm. that image we talked about earlier where the recognition that the center needs the outer edges mm-hmm. to have any kind of shape at all or to mm-hmm. hold a shape, mm-hmm. you know, that we can hold, help hold the shape mm-hmm. of the group or the community or or the, you know, in some ways – a world Mm -hmm. that that's makes it different. You know, that makes you more able to walk out the door that you're not nothing, Mm -hmm. that you're not the one doing it wrong, that you're the one who has sort of secret magic (laughs) information (laughs) that, you know, we find story bridges to each other. And, and we're also the keepers of stories and the, the people who help 
people bridge stories to each other. Um, and it, it can make you feel useful. It can help you feel a little bit more useful instead of just depressed. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And it, it makes me think like, you know, it's not just, it's not just, I have value too. It's like, I have value and a unique yes. experience that like, these people at the center don't know they need it, but they need right. it. <laughs> and by stepping, you know, by practicing acceptance, it strengthens my role as a misfit so I can help give what I know the world needs yes. and at the same time help myself as opposed to fix myself first to be just considered on par with everyone else. It's like, actually, right. I, I'm going to walk us down a better road. That's right. I mean, in my own narratives of describing hard, sad things that have happened to me, I often use the image of going to the bottom of the ocean. And so if that's depression or getting as low as I can get, what I've discovered a a useful narrative to carry alongside that is, well, what's down there? Given the fact that I'm not dead and I'm not, I am making it, you know, I'm still around. What's down there on the ocean floor that's useful that maybe I could bring up to the surface so other people don't have to come down here and look for it. (laughs) And that's been a really good image for me, you know, that's been a, you know, if you're going to go down to the bottom, go get something useful (laughs) and bring it back so other people don't have to. Um, And that helps me. I love that. I love that. Um, before before we wrap up, I wanted to get kind of maybe some insight on how you feel art and creativity um, can can help us in in self healing. Oh, I think it's everything, and the reason I think it's everything is that I'm convinced that self-expression is a release from the sort of binding shackles of cultural stories that make you feel like crap. Self-expression in any form, I don't just mean writing, I mean any Mm -hmm. kind of expressive form, especially in collaboration with others, especially sharing it with other mammals, is an energy. I don't quite mean it in the woo sense, but I suppose a little bit I do mean it in the idea that when we share stories, we make a kinetic energy that actually is a form of medicine. Mm. And so artistic practice in and of itself, whether or not you go show a painting in a gallery or you get a book published or you have a podcast or you become a filmmaker or any of those things, that's not as important as the idea that we can all participate in self-expression as a form of reconnecting to each other. And, and in that sense, that's, that's probably more important than any individual's success in their own career or life. Can we remember how to create narrative energy and medicine with one another and reject this world that's trying to divide us daily? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah, when you let the world divide you, it's likely to lead to, to more suffering, you know, so it's part, it's part of our collective resilience. Um, That's right. And I love the idea of art and self-expression, um, you know, whether it's journaling or a vision board or reflecting, um, you know, I mean, and even as it comes back to the idea of, you know, okay, well, what am I going to do to take care of myself today? What direction am I following? That it gives you a space to, to engage with what you value and what your desires are and just connect to your feelings and emotion that we often don't take time for. Right. Um, but doing so, I feel like can strengthen your resolve that there are things you care very deeply about. And sure, it is probably going to be hard if you're on the outside edges and, you know, the center is powerful um, and you're doing something that is, you know, 
not in line with what, what the center wants you to do. It can definitely be hard, but we have to have something that we can grasp that matters to us. And, yeah. and I see that, you know, coming out through this, you know, well, let me participate in some form of self-expression so I yes. can see it and feel it. Um, you know, and yeah, there may be that kinetic energy behind it too, but like that, that, that is actually a form of a step toward your liberation and toward absolutely, liberating others. Absolutely. And, and always we have to keep reminding each other too, that as we're articulating those edges, mm-hmm. we're giving the center a shape and without us, the center don't got no shape at all. <laughs> it's a squiggle. <laughs> and that's right. And that's not nothing. That's a big deal mm-hmm. that, you know, who articulates the edges determines what the shape's going to be. I, I think it's a, it's a thing misfits can, and, and people who are waking up every day trying to figure out how to be kinder to themselves. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a worth Mm-hmm. It's an important worth and it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm finding myself needing to also say like, also don't get stuck in the other comparison. Like, well, I'm not misfit enough, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I already, I hear that from some people <laughs> and I want to remind people like, you know, this isn't a podium. <laughs> this is, you know, everybody's got pieces of misfit in uh-huh. them, like we said at the start. Yeah. So that's true. Um, but not everyone is, you know, um, occupying the space of misfit the yes. same. And that doesn't matter. Right. There's no one definition of misfit. I'm not claiming that, nor is anyone else. Yeah. We're just trying to amplify a piece of the human story mm-hmm. that sometimes gets made invisible. Mm-hmm. And you're reducing the otherness, which then promotes unity. And, you know, unity is peace. I mean... Yeah. So that's a pretty big job, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyone can do it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Anyone can. Yeah. That's so wonderful. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I think a great way to, um, you know, be thinking about, you know, the year ahead and the next step that we, you know, feel like we want to take for ourselves and families. And, um, you know, I, I, I enjoyed your book so much. I know there's going to be many more great things to come from you. Um, and I just would love to ask how could listeners, uh, follow or connect with you if they really want to know where you're going to be or what you have to offer, what would be the best ways that they could do that? Sure. Well, I run creativity workshops in Portland, Oregon called Corporeal Writing, Mm. and I'm easily found on social media through our website at Corporeal Writing. And so that'd be a good way for people to see if they want to connect or what I'm doing next or how to come to Portland and join us. And um, our workshops are for any kind of person. And that's, they're non-academic and that's a, that's a good way to find us. Oh, that's so great. I'm going to check that out myself. You may see me (laughs) soon. (laughs) No problem. All right. Thank you so much for joining me on Body Kindness. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And that's our show. Let's continue this conversation in our Facebook group. Just search Body Kindness Podcast and ask to join the group. We also love ratings and reviews. Please subscribe to the Body Kindness Podcast and give us an honest rating and review. And if you can, tell a friend. If you'd like to support the podcast for the 2018 season, please donate at gofundme.com slash bodykindness.